Well, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Monarch Butterfly Conservation Series. This is a webinar series that's a partnership with the Monarch Joint Venture and the National Conservation Training Center. My name is Corrine Motivans, and I work here at the National Conservation Training Center. We're located in the eastern panhandle of West Virginia, and the spring wildflowers are here. Uh, our early pollinators are just getting busy. Um, it is a beautiful spring in the east this year. I hope it is as well where you are. The topic of our webinar today is in response to the top suggestions we received from many of you a few months ago when we asked you what topics are of most importance to you. The answer we got as a majority answer by far was restoration topics. Please tell us what to do with existing landscapes, with new ground, and uh, modifying you know, uh, other places and enhancing other places. So, uh, last time when we had our webinar, uh, we talked about starting from bare ground. This uh, month's webinar is on enhancing existing landscapes for monarchs and native pollinators. We've got a huge group here today and six speakers ready to share all their knowledge. So it's a really exciting webinar for us today. So without further ado, I'd like to invite my MJV partner, Wendy Codwell, to introduce today's presenters. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here today. Like Corrine mentioned, I'm Wendy Caldwell, and I'm the coordinator for the Monarch Joint Venture. Uh, without any further ado, I'm happy to introduce the six speakers that we have here today. First, we'll hear from Greg Hoke, who is the Prairie Habitat Team Supervisor for the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Next, we'll hear from the Tallgrass Prairie Center. And from the Tallgrass Prairie Center, um, you'll hear from Christine Nemec, who is the Integrated Roadside Vegetation Manager, and then from Laura Jackson, who is the Director. The next series of presenters is from, are from the Pollinator Partnership. First, Vicki Wojcik is the Research Director for Pollinator Partnership, and then Mary Byrne, the Plant Ecologist. Lastly, we'll hear from Angie Babbitt, who is the Communications Coordinator for Monarch Watch. So with that, I, I would like to turn it over to our first presenter, Greg Hoke. Hey, thank you, Wendy. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to kind of do the 30,000-foot um, overview, um, just speaking in some broad generalities. Um, probably anything I say today, can't. there will be exceptions uh, due on location and situation and everything, but I'm trying to paint with a, a fairly broad brush. What I'm going to be doing is giving kind of some of the background and some of the literature review, and then the others are going to go into some of the details um, and provide some, some more uh, some concrete uh, case studies and examples. Okay. Um, so last time we were talking about starting from scratch. Uh, generally in the Midwest, what we're talking about there is direct seeding into soybean stubble, uh, which I have shown there on the uh, upper right. Um, this is, there's relatively little competition um, in these situations from, there might be some weeds out there, but um, kind of everything's starting from scratch. Um, the other thing what we want to talk about today is, is, a sta is seeding into established vegetation. Um, this is where there's, we're going to have some issues with seed to soil contact and also competition. Um, the picture I have in there, um, that is a stand of big blue stem up in uh, north central Minnesota. Um, if you can believe it, there, uh, there at the end of the arrow, there is a 95-pound Labrador retriever, um, and he's only about 10 or 12 feet from me. Um, so that site was so thick, um, you could barely walk through it. Um, and that's kind of some of the situations that we deal with um, when we're going into existing vegetation. Okay. So um, the prairie is a very competitive environment, uh, both above ground and below ground. And if you're a seedling trying to become established, you can have quite a bit of difficulty um, kind of getting going um, when you're competing with all those plants that you know, could be you know, decades old and have lots of energy stored up in their roots. And as soon as spring gets here, they're ready to pop up and get going. Okay. So here I have just a little cartoon of what we, what we kind of deal with. So over on the left, I've got a little green seed there, um, and it's caught in some thatch uh, on the ground. The problem here is the seed is never going to contact the soil. 
Okay? So quite often what we'll do then is we'll do a prescribed fire. Um, we'll clear off the thatch. That's great because that will allow our seeds to come in contact with the soil. But we also know that when you burn uh, tall grass prairie, it really stimulates the growth. Um, so what I have there on the right side of the uh, cartoon is I've got all those established grasses and that they're nice and tall and they got or they will be nice and tall by the end of the summer and even starting in the spring they got those nice big thick deep uh, roots and then right there in the middle we've got a little teeny tiny seedling um, trying to get us started both going up with the shoots and going down with the roots and it's just going to be really hard for that little um, seedling to get going um, competing basically against all of those adult plants. Okay. So um, why would we seed into existing vegetation? I think we all know that um, here today. We're trying to enrich diversity. Some places where we might do this would be like an old brome field or an early CRP planting, which is pretty much can often be like just a blue stem monoculture. Okay. Um, there are a couple of things to be thinking about here. Um, if it's in really, really bad shape, it may be easier to just start over from scratch. Um, in this case, you're going to take your existing vegetation, disc it or plow it under, and you may plant row crops for a year or two. Um, and then, then you'll go back and seed it to um, you know, the, the, the vegetation you like. Um, if you've got an old CRP field, um, that works really well. This is not going to work really well, um, for instance, in a roadside um, type of situation. Um, then there's just the direct seeding into the vegetation, okay? And the, 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 the issue there is you need to overcome the competition, and you also need to, and to do that, what you're going to want to do is knock back the existing vegetation to some extent. Um, and I've given four examples here. Um, none of them are perfect. Um, none of them are going to work in every situation. Um, so you are going to have to kind of, you know, and there are probably more than these four. Uh, but what you want to do is you just want to do something to kind of weaken that existing vegetation to give those seedlings kind of a, a fighting chance that first, or that first year or so. So one of the first ways we can, we've done this in the past is herbicide, um, either before or immediately after the seeding. Um, quite often what I've seen done is you do a burn, you let the burn green up for a week or so, and then you go in and herbicide it. Um, heavy grazing for the year before you do the seeding, um, and by heavy, I mean really heavy, double, triple, quadruple stock it, um, remove all the above ground vegetation, weaken the roots, um, don't let the plants put in their root reserves in the latter half of the summer. Um, light disking, um, just you know, basically a, a little bit more than scratching the surface, but not much, um, or then just a repeated mowing the summer after the seeding. Like I said, each one of these um, does have its issues, um, and none of them can work in every situation. Okay, so just to go through the literature review real quick, real quickly here, this is not comprehensive. I don't have every paper um, in the literature on here, but I, I think I've got a fair sampling. Um, so looking at native prairie, and this came out of Kansas Prairie in Kansas, um, Emily Benson and Dave Hartnett um, looked at basically clonal reproduction from bud marrow stems versus um, reproduction from the seed bank. And what they basically showed was there's almost no reproduction from the seed banks. Um, they did show that there was, early in the summer there was some germination and some seedlings, um, but those would pretty much die out um, pretty quickly um, as the summer went along. Um, and what they concluded then is that seed production and seed bank populations have little short-term influence over the population dynamics um, in a prairie. Then in their 2006 paper, what they showed is that clonally produced ramets are basically, again, greater, greater than 99% of all shoots present. So again, in established prairie, and this is native prairie, not restored, there's very little reproduction from seed. Okay, um, then I'll just run through a few more here. Uh, Martin and Wilsey, um, quoting them, mimicking the effects of grazing may increase the emergence when seeds are added. So what they were doing here is they seeded the area, and then they, t then they put cattle in there and grazed it. Um, Foster et al. working in Kansas uh, did some clipping and raking. Um, the issue when you do clipping or mowing, the, le the, the, the thatch lays on top of the seedlings potentially. So some people talk about you either want to cut it frequently so you get very, very small pieces of thatch, or if you do cut it and you've got a lot of thatch, get that thatch off of there so it's not laying on top of the seedlings. 
But anyway, they increased species to richness by about 25% when they did that clipping and raking versus leaving it undisturbed. Uh, working in Iowa, um, uh, Williams Jackson Smith, um, who you'll be hearing from shortly, um, did frequent mowing. Um, and what they showed there is the overwinter survival was 3% in the mo or uh, overwinter mortality was 3% in the mode and 20%, 29% in the control. And then by the fourth season, forbs were two times as abundant in the mode sites. And what they concluded was that mowing reduces the competition for light from large established grasses, allowing forbs seedlings the opportunity to reach sufficient size. Uh, again, going back to Kansas, um, they did some clipping studies. And what they found was the um, clipping almost doubled the richness across the treatments. And then McCain, Bear, Blair, and Wilson, this is some work, again, at, K at Kanza Prairie, but in a restored part of, the, of Kanza Prairie. Um, they showed the increased light availability by removing big blue stem, increased the cover and biomass of native forbs. Um, this suggests that management approaches that reduce the abundance of the cover of this dominant grass may promote co cover and a biomass of those forb species. Okay, the intermediate disturbance hypothesis, which everybody probably remembers from their undergraduate ecology course, basically shows that diversity over here on the, hor on the vertical axis and disturbance, um, whether that's in di disturbance intensity or disturbance in frequency, going from low to high. So at very low levels of disturbance, you basically have your best competitors, in our case, big blue stem, crowding everybody else out. At really, really high disturbances, there's only a few quote unquote weeds that can survive. So what we want to do in our management for diversity is kind of find that sweet spot um, kind of in the middle of that bell curve where we have enough disturbance to kind of knock back the, the, the dominant species, but not so much disturbance that, the, that it becomes a really weedy site. Okay. Um, then again, there's a whole series of papers um, that basically have studied um, restorations through time. And what they have found is that in the older restorations, you get more of a shift towards those warm season grasses. Um, again, because the, those uh, super competitors are just kind of crowding out um, some of the other species. So both for established and, and for maintenance, you need to rely on some level of disturbance. OK, so if you just go out and throw some seed into established vegetation, um, you won't have a total failure, uh, but you probably will be disappointed, and you potentially can waste a fair amount of money on your seed. Um, and just the point here is um, interceding into existing vegetation may be a longer-term commitment than just throwing seed out and calling it good. Um, so you just need a little more TLC, tender loving care, um, with, with the sites where you're doing this um, than, than you may, um, may be budgeting for or planning for. So just be considering that. Um, obviously, lots of site inspections, checking out the sites, um, doing a little monitoring will, will be very helpful. But um, there are some things to consider when, when seeding into, into existing vegetation that you may not be thinking about if you're used to um, uh, seeding into soybean stubble or bare ground. And with that, I will pass it on to the next, next presenter. Hello, everyone. This is Christine. I'm going to give an overview of integrated roadside vegetation management. IRVM is an approach to roadside management that combines a variety of management techniques with ecological principles. In Iowa, IRVM legislation was implemented in 1988. The main incentive for the legislation was to protect groundwater by reducing use of herbicides on roadside weeds. However, the legislation also said roadsides should be managed for many purposes, including wildlife habitat. In Iowa, IRVM has largely been applied along state and county roads. The Iowa DOT handles IRVM along state roads as well as federal highways. And the IRVM office at the Tallgrass Prairie Center helps counties and cities with their IRVM needs. There's three main principles of IRVM. The first is to reduce the use of herbicides. So instead of blanket spraying large areas of roadsides, regardless of the extent of the weed problem, only the worst weed infestations or the high priority areas are spot sprayed. Roadsides are also managed by spot mowing and by prescribed fire. Prescribed fire is preferable, but if burning is not feasible, maybe because of a lack of resources or because of high traffic counts, then spot mowing may be used in some cases as well. 
The third technique that's typically used is the seeding of native species. Hydro seeding is often used to apply seed on roadside slopes, which are too steep for drills. And drills or broadcast seeding may be used in some areas if the slopes are of appropriate. I will talk a little bit more about seeding in a little bit. Now, at the program level in Iowa, there are several components of IRVM. There's a statewide coordinator housed at the Tallgrass Prairie Center, which is my position. There's a small grants program administered to the state DOT. This is the Living Roadway Trust Fund. Through this, counties can apply for equipment and other resources to support their IRVM program. And the Living Roadway Trust Fund also funds a lot of education and outreach. There's federal monies for county seed purchase. Currently, there's 37 counties with full-time roadside managers who focus on managing vegetation throughout the county. And there's an, another 20 counties with some roadside program, but not a full-time roadside manager. So they might have a county engineer who gets native seed for the roadsides, but the focus of the engineer position isn't totally on roadside vegetation. They, they balance a lot of other duties related to their engineering position. For the IRVM coordinator role that helps the counties, the main duties are to maintain the relationships with county roadside managers and to renew, recruit new counties. It's a voluntary program, so counties don't have to participate in IRVM if they don't want to. But you try to tout the, the benefits of the program and encourage counties to make it part of their program. They organize an annual roadside conference. This is one of the main training events for roadside managers. Produce how-to publications, facilitate networking among the counties and with our partners, the other agencies, such as the DOT, and maintain awareness of policies and regulations affecting roadsides. Since 1998, the IRVM program has received a federal grant or funds from the Transportation Alternatives Program for Native Seed. Every year, counties with IRVM programs can submit requests to receive this seed. In a typical year, the counties request enough seed to seed around 1,000 up to 1,400 or so acres across the state, just along the county roadsides alone. We typically provide two seed mixes. So you can see them listed here. The clean-out mix is a lower diversity mix for ditch clean-outs, which is completely bare soil, highly degraded areas. And we also offer a diversity mix, which has a typically a total of anywhere from 30, 35, up to 40 species for the diversity mix compared to around 15 to 20 for the clean-out mix. So this shows what we had for 2015 as far as number of species. Across both mixes this year, we had 169 pounds of butterfly milkweed and 525 pounds of swamp milkweed. Now, over the last 10 years, between 2006 and 2015, over that period, we distributed a total of over 1,200 pounds of swamp milkweed seed and over 500 pounds of butterfly milkweed seed to the counties. So as I said, it's a voluntary program. This map shows the number of counties that have obtained seed from 1998 to present being last year. Of the 99 counties in Iowa, 85 have received seed at some point. Some counties are very involved and get seed year after year, while other counties only get seed now and then. The County Board of Supervisors is the main group at the county level that decides if they should have a roadside manager. And where they decide to place the roadside manager greatly affects how IRVM is implemented or the resources available to that roadside manager. The manager may be placed in the engineer's office where they have a lot of funding, they have more resources available, but they may do a lot of other duties, such as snow removal, mowing shoulders, and cutting brush. If the roadside manager sits in the county conservation board, they typically have more time for outreach and education, more time for planning vegetation activities. Many of these roadside managers are also weed commissioners and deal with weed complaints or addressing weed problems throughout the county. So many of them juggle many duties. They also deal with landowners who have varying support varying levels of support for IRVM. So if you want to learn more about IRVM and how it's implemented in Iowa, you can go to our website. We have information on the Living Roadway Trust Fund. We have a copy of our technical manual, which has a lot of technical details about how to manage roadsides, how to get seedings established, and also there's information on how to start an IRVM program. And with that, thank you for your time and attention.
Thank you, Christine. This is Laura Jackson, continuing with some uh, information on other work that we do at the Tallgrass Prairie Center that relates to our situation here. Uh, I'd also like to thank Greg for his presentation on the, those basic concepts on uh, establishing vegetation. I think it's much more important to talk about the basic concepts than to get down into the weeds of tiny details because all of our locations are so different and also all of our contexts for work are different and we see that a lot with the roadside programs. So the Tallgrass Prairie Center is located at the University of Northern Iowa and our mission is to restore native vegetation for the benefit of society and the environment. And we work in a variety of different contexts. Um, the first one you just heard about, integrated roadside vegetation management. We've served those counties with uh, technical information and really learned that y it's not a one-shot deal. You have to keep going year after year. I'm going to talk today about how you make sure that the seed that is, of, uh, that is planted out there is uh, appropriate and, and genetically appropriate and genetically diverse. And that had become a central problem whenever you have a sudden surge in demand for some sort of native vegetation. You look at the seed costs and they're very high and you look at the seed availability and it may include a lot of things that aren't native to the area or, or are insufficiently well adapted to the area. And so while that's not a nitty gritty on the ground question of how do you get plants established, it's very important to start out with the right genetic material. Um, we also, just uh, by the by, we also are involved in um, restoration research for biomass energy, for uh, restoration on farms, and also for restoration just in urban areas. So we deal with a, a lot of different kinds of clients. So um, the, the big question is where is all this milkweed seed going to come from, especially if there's a large amount of demand for that seed and money um, flying around uh, to, to plant it. And we, address, we had to address this issue when we first started getting uh, uh, seed, those uh, $300,000 grants from the Federal Transportation Enhancement uh, Program. Where is all that seed going to come from? And how do we build the commercial capacity to produce native seed uh, in the state of Iowa? The, uh, so I'm going to give you some general principles and then a couple of specific examples of, what, of how we did it here that I think can be applied in other parts of the country. First of all, you have to build a case for a regionally adapted and genetically diverse seed from the seed buyers. So wh whatever the program is or whatever the funding source is that wants to go out and buy, buy milkweed seed and put it on the landscape, they have to, to uh, be lobbied and they need to be able to understand how important it is for regionally adapted, genetically diverse seed. This may be an easier sell than it was 20 years ago when we first got started. But whenever seed prices are high, people's uh, will begins to fail. So um, the first thing uh, after that is to think about um, the, the situation that a potential commercial native seed producer is in. They need to make a profit. And so how, um, how this is structured, if, if we want to encourage this capacity for commercial production, that involves uh, profit somewhere down the line for, for these um, producers. The, the large consistent buyer in the case of Iowa, the Iowa Department of Transportation, is the real driver in this, uh, in this situation. And what they do, and what they choose to do, determines whether or not uh, genetically appropriate seed will be commercially available. And uh, uh, then from then on, it has to do with some really nitty gritty details about how they put out their bid specs for buying the seed. The commercial seed producers are going to pay attention to what is being purchased and what is, what, what is actually being asked for. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, finally, I'll talk about how you subsidize the creation of this foundation, foundation genetics for the seed industry so that um, it's available and they can make a profit selling native uh, milkweed seed that's genetically diverse, that's appropriate for, for your region. 
Uh, don't look at all the details here. This is uh, an example um, of the kind of language that would go into creating a bid request that privileges uh, seed that is genetically diverse, that is appropriate for the, the site. Uh, so this is a, a quote from a particular State Department of Transportation seed bid request that goes out to commercial producers. And it, it prioritizes the kind of seed that they want and how much they're willing to pay over and above a seed that has uh, lesser qualities. So again, don't look at all the details there. But it, it is the specifics of that language that are going to drive and structure the native seed market. Um, this slide illustrates how long it takes to create that type of seed, seed that is source identified, you know where it came from, that has a identity that is certified by a third party um, some kind of a third party system. The, uh, if, you, if you look down to year five, that's the year that a commercial native seed company could harvest and market native seed that has been produced uh, from, or, with origins from remnant prairies in, in, in a particular region of the state. So that's five years to get to actually getting an income. What we did in Iowa was to subsidize the development of that foundation seed by doing that here at the Tallgrass Prairie Center and then offering it for release to seed companies. So year one is collecting wild seed from multiple populations all over the, the state or the region. Uh, year two is growing it out in the greenhouse, transplanting it into the field and growing it out. Year three may be the first year that seed is actually uh, being produced by those plants. You know, they're perennials, they grow slowly. And then beginning in year three, and then, and then going on for several years more, we would be growing the seed, storing it in our coolers, and waiting for seed companies to call us and say, do you have some swamp milkweed for southern Iowa? And we would say yes. We would send that out to them. Uh, in year four, they would transplant it and grow it uh, out for themselves, and then only in year five will they be marketing it to the general public or to your uh, federal program that's buying milkweed seed. So as you can see, it's a very long process, and if that seed is not yet available in your region, it's going to take three years to get to the point where somebody has seed to grow out into, in, in production plots. So we were able to short circuit that and make it possible for commercial entities to start uh, growing and therefore getting some income from their uh, commercial seed production um, in, in a shorter period of time with less risk and less cost to them. Uh, but we don't give away seed or sell seed to the general public. We just provide that foundation seed. So it's a, it's a long process, and that's why it can be expensive initially when, when you start looking for native swamp milkweed or other species that are, are uh, local to your area. Right now, prices are very good in Iowa. I think we spent 3 or $4 an ounce for swamp milkweed this year, which is um, a very good price. These are just some images. You don't have to think too hard on these slides. That was the, hard, the, the last slide was a hard slide to follow. Uh, this is what it looks like after it's been collected. Seed's been collected in the fall. This is a nectar species, um, very important during the fall migration in our part of the world, Liatris ligula stylus. And um, it was collected in the fall by volunteers. It's brought here. We grow it out in our greenhouse. And then that goes out into production plots the following spring. That's what we're doing right now is uh, working the ground, getting it ready for transplanting those seedlings from the greenhouse, and then it's grown out in plots, and this would be starting in year two or year three even. Um, then we have various methods of collection, uh, repeated hand collections, as well as uh, mechanized uh, seed collection. And then um, after that, uh, we have seed cleaning equipment. This is the kind of equipment that commercial seed companies would also have. Then that is all stored um, and uh, put in our cooler. 
And these are the different zones that we've established. I mentioned the profit uh, potential. And uh, the size of the market is really important for the commercial producer. So they need to know that the, the seed that you're uh, that we've created, there's going to be a demand for. And so it can't be too tiny of an area. It's got to be a broad enough zone that um, a lot of different uh, buyers are out there to buy that native seed. So um, the seed gets a yellow tag, which indicates that it is from a particular source. It's been identified. And um, these seeds are then made available for commercial production. So um, this is a sort of a summary. If uh, we're in a position right now with this huge demand for planting a lot of milkweeds very quickly, um, uh, sort of whatever it takes mode, uh, we're, in a, we're in a huge potential to either develop the capacity for commercial production of native seed or uh, to discourage that commercial capacity. And we've seen this in Iowa with our roadside program. There's some big mistakes that can be avoided. The first big mistake is to subsidize seed or give it away, because um, that will only discourage the commercial capacity. That's, uh, that's number one. It's a big investment, and they just can't afford to uh, spend a lot of money establishing seed production plots and then see all of their customers um, evaporate and uh, just getting free seed. It just have to resist the impulse. The, the second point is um, cus consumers have to be protected from substitutes. So uh, when you see the price is high, you say, well, let's bring in this other source from you know, 600 miles away that's very, very cheap. Consumers need to be able to get seed that is the right quality and the right genetics for their area. And for our for our region, the best uh, solution has been this yellow tag third party certified source identified program that uh, ensures you know what you're getting when you, when you buy that bag of seed. The third lesson is um, don't send mixed messages about what species are needed and, and where they need to come from. Those bid specs should be very specific about exactly what is wanted. and um, don't allow exceptions if prices are too high. Believe it or not, they will come down the next year, maybe by 10 or even 100 fold. Um, uh, if, if there's a lot of, of demand, the, the market will, will respond to that. And uh, seed will be available for much, much cheaper the next year. If the demand is inconsistent from year to year, then that uh, makes commercial producers crazy. And they just stop uh, trying to be in that market. So um, it, this is a way to establish good capacity for native seeds, including milkweed and other nectar species, for a long time. Um, native seed, uh, source identified native seed grew r dramatically. Uh, and that can happen very quickly, adding species as uh, the, the needs are, are felt. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker. Okay, yeah, and thank you everyone for having me here. Um, my name is Vicki Wojcik from Pollinator Partnership, and I'll be co-presenting this part of the presentation with our plant ecologist, Mary Byrne. And we're going to focus on some specific management techniques that target right-of-way management, more narrowly utility rights-of-way under um, overhead power lines, and how they can really benefit monarch butterflies. So the thing about utility rights of way, at least the way we see them, is that there are these areas of habitat underneath power lines, perhaps on top of oil and gas pipelines, where the landscape is already intensively managed for a specific purpose, and that is to maintain lower growing vegetation that promotes safe energy transmission or access to the structures for maintenance. But we know that rights of way can actually make a really big difference in terms of pollinator habitat because if you make minor adjustments to how these rights of way are managed, you can actually have a huge benefit for pollinators. So there's some background work on a full range of correctly managed green spaces in habitats that aren't natural, they're not wildlands. 
but really these green spaces can act as habitat reserves when they're managed for the purpose of promoting a certain wildlife species. One of the reasons why electrical rights of way are so influential is that this is a really significant landscape type. There are acres and acres of utility rights of way. So just some rough numbers thrown out there. Within North America, we have about 400,000 linear kilometers of rights of way in Canada and 800,000 linear kilometers in the United States. These landscapes or these utility rights of ways connect and intersect with multiple habitat types. And more specifically, they have prescribed and actually mandated management regimes. And I'll explain these in a little bit more detail in a sec, but they come from NERC and FERC, which are the North American Electrical Reliability Commission, as well as the Federal Electrical Reliability Commission. And these mandates actually state that you must maintain the landscape in a certain way. And if you think about it, each year, more than a million monarchs are moving north and south along their traditional migratory routes. When we look at a map of the monarch migration, like this map created by Monarch Watch, we see the general pathways where monarchs are flying. What we've done is compared this monarch flyway to where you see actually existing major utility transmission corridors in the United States. And when you look at this, you actually see some parallels between when, where monarchs are moving geographically and where you have a concentration of utility rights of way. So our program and outreach campaign to utility managers is really looking at how they can manage rights of way for pollinators, monarchs in particular, and really help monarchs where, they're, where they need the help the most along their flyway. A tiny bit of background on how a right of way is managed. It's managed in a model called the border zone, wire zone model, where vegetation of a certain height is acceptable within some zones and a different height in other zones. So in the wire zone, the area that's most likely to come in contact potentially with the transmission wires, vegetation has to be kept below 20 feet. Um, close to the transmission zone and the border zone, the vegetation is still required to be relatively low, um, kept to 30 or 40 feet depending on the voltage that's being carried in the electrical wires. Now in 2003, some of you may remember, there was a pretty historic blackout that happened in the Northeast. An investigation of what caused that blackout turned out to be that there was a tree on underneath the right of way that came in contact with the overhead wires on a particularly hot day when the wires were sagging quite a bit. It caused an arc and it sparked through the system and power went out to more than 30 million individuals. It was very, very significant and it lasted for a long time. The impacts of this resulted in very strict federal level compliance guidelines that actually had developed a fine system where utility companies can face a fine of $1 million per day, per tree, or piece of vegetation. That's in violation of these minimum standards. So the response of some utilities is out of fear of being audited or not being in compliance and fines. They've decided to go to a mow frequently mow to the ground model. We know from some of the work that's been done on uh, butterfly management and pollinator management that targeted mowing and a IVM or integrative vegetation management approach uh, really does help promote butterfly species. So we know that host plants are really significant to determining butterfly presence. There's also research, specifically from rights of ways, that suggests that increasing scalloped or rough edges and providing more bare ground provides better butterfly habitats. And of course, when you open an area and you provide sunlight, it supports butterfly basking behaviors. Extensive mowing, that's, that is conducted by some utilities that are fearful um, for being audited uh, and have taken this approach, actually can remove a food source. So timing is everything. And there's some research out there specifically to rights of waste that does show that when you limit and time your mowing, you can be very successful in increasing species occurrence. So the Pollinator Partnership has a right-of-way management program that has a few set out goals. 
and that's to develop habitat sites that will actually increase the populations of agriculturally important bees as well as other pollinators, test alternative right-of-way management, develop partnership between stakeholders, and create transferable management plans so that everyone can go forward and manage rights-of-way for pollinators. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague Mary Byrne now to describe the habitat management process in more detail. Hi, thank you so much, Vicki. Um, this is Mary Byrne, also with the Pollinator Partnership, where I work as the plant ecologist. Um, in my section, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the monarch habitat development process. Um, again, this is a very kind of high level um, process and explanation. And as we all know, uh, things get much more detailed once you pick a specific site and start working with it. To assist people um, trying to develop monarch habitat on utility rights of way and also on corporate land, we developed with the help of many partners you'll see on our different manual and monarch joint venture a series of um, habitat development manuals. These manuals contain a step-by-step -step process that allow the readers to kind of um, pick off different pieces of the monarch habitat development process and and take one and, and work with it instead of feeling overwhelmed by the process. Additionally, there's a regional um, planting list in the back. These regions are fairly large. We have four guides for utility rights of way for the Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, and Southwest. We have four more guides for corporate lands, Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest. So the Monarch Habitat Development Process is outlined here in nine different steps. Uh, again, we're trying to make the process as um, bite-sized as possible so it's easy enough to manage from start to finish. The first step um, is site selection. Um, and what we've done in the manuals is provide a rubric so that you'll have a system that will allow for objective evaluation. This is really helpful when you're working across either a large site or evaluating multiple sites for developing monarch habitat. This is also really helpful if you have multiple stakeholders or coworkers with different opinions about which site should be developed for monarch habitat. The, um, the rubric allows each site to be evaluated using the same criteria and objectively evaluated and then scored so that you could sit down as a group and select a site with the least amount of challenges um, and just have a, a frank conversation about which one will be easiest. We always recommend for people to develop the, the site that provide, proposes the least amount of challenges so that you'll be successful on the first go around. Some potential challenges that many, many sites have. Um, I haven't found a site that doesn't have at least one of these. Um, invasive species, salt, water access, um, adjacent lands or property issues, heavy recreational use, um, livestock or deer grazing, and then other environmental factors. It's very important that you be upfront about all of the potential challenges and to manage the expectations of your coworkers, yourself, and then other stakeholders that are interested in developing monarch habitat on the right of way. The next step we suggest is to establish roles and responsibilities. If you're trying to involve community partners or other people in your office, it's really helpful to them if you give them a role and responsibility and be specific about it. Planning. Planning, like anything, is very important. You'll start planning even before you select the site, but it often has to be spelled out. Um, again, make sure you set specific goals and action items. Be realistic about time, budget, and commitments from partners. If your budget is set at a certain dollar figure, stay within that budget and don't hope for other partners to come up with additional funds. Again, your budget is very important for managing your project as well as managing the expectations of your other stakeholders and par partners. It's not always necessary that you share your budget with the outside um, group within your company, but internally it is important to keep tabs on uh, what direction you'd like to see the habitat develop in. And five, timeline. Timeline is very important, and it also helps you to make a complete list of the actions that need to be undertaken. Um, again, work with your partners to set realistic timelines 
you know, if the, the site is on a, a, a public park, they have a big event one week, you need to be no, um, notified of that so you don't plan any um, planting or um, tilling uh, events on that time. And also keep in mind seasonal restraints and constraints. Um, here in Cleveland, it was uh, snowing today. Um, I know in other parts of the country, um, field season is well underway. Planting is taking place. Um, we're still about a month away. So it's very important to keep um, any kind of se seasonal constraints in mind when doing your timeline. Site preparation and planting. This is kind of the, the funnest part of, um, of Monarch Habitat development for a lot of volunteer groups. They love to get out there and plant plants. Um, but you need to decide whether or not you're going to seed or use plants. Um, seeds are often uh, the least expensive option, but they take several years to mature. Um, plug plants, on the other hand, are more expensive. However, um, you'll see that that habitat develop much more quickly. You could even get blooms, you know, within um, within the month. You know, potentially monarchs as well. So it all depends on your timeline. If you need a um, a habitat developed immediately for for whatever reason, I would suggest plug plants. If you have several years to wait for the habitat to develop, uh, you could use seeds. Maintenance. So as this slide here um, says, the work isn't over once the habitat has been planted. So while all the volunteers love to come out for the big planting day, try to draft a maintenance calendar um, at the beginning of this process so that you know um, what tasks need to be done when. And these are often the less glamorous tasks of pulling weeds, um, potentially mulching, doing things like that, watering if you're using plug plants. Um, water is often a, an issue. Um, you generally need to water as soon as you plant plug plants. So um, make a list and try to see if any of those volunteers that were so enthusiastic about planting wouldn't mind coming around to do some weeding. Um, in a number of our projects, we've engaged the local master gardening group to assist with weeding. And finally, education, outreach, and certification. You want to share your accomplishment with your community, with all of the stakeholders. So um, you could install an interpretive sign. You could hold a pollinator week event either on site or, or off site explaining what you did. Um, you could apply for Wildlife Habitat Council certification, which will, of course, elevate your project to a national or international um, stage. And you could also register um, your new monarch habitat with SHARE. It's an initiative of the Pollinator Partnership. And you'll have um, a piece of the puzzle of habitat across the country when you log your newly developed monarch habitat on the SHARE site. And here you could see a monarch garden that was developed in a um, parking lot median. Um, installing the sign here helps manage the expectations of people that, that are coming in and out of this parking lot every day. They're aware now that it's a monarch habitat. It'll connect them to monarchs now. Um, previously, it was just a heavy traffic parking lot. Lots of people are coming in and out. They don't necessarily know um, what's going on on site. And you certainly don't want anybody to think that you're um, you're doing anything detrimental to um, the, the existing um, habitat. And finally, data collection. This isn't always necessary to develop monarch habitat. But if you're interested in really tracking um, the influence your site has on pollinator abundance and diversity, um, collecting poll plant pollinator interaction data is vital. You're welcome to do that as a citizen science approach. You could contact the Pollinator Partnership or others for um, professional support. Um, there's lots of information out there on how to collect poll plant pollinator data and um, you know, catalog uh, monarch um, visitation and really feed into some of the national citizen science uh, efforts going on. So I'll pass it over to the next presenter. Thank you. My name is Angie Babin. I'm with Monarch Watch from the University of Kansas. And um, I'm going to go ahead and get started here. The, the um, focus that Monarch Watch has been um, primarily engaged with is the area here where you see 50% um, 
natal origins of monarch butterflies that are found in Mexico. This was determined by doing a um, genetic, I mean, a, a, an isotope study, and that determined that the areas where the butterflies were coming from in Mexico were mostly from this area where there's 50% natal origins. And the rest of the butterflies are coming from the 95% area. Um, so those are our, our big focuses for restoration in the eastern part of the United States. And here you can see these areas again. In, in Texas, the butterflies are going to be um, the, the butterflies are going to be experiencing uh, milkweed early on here as they come north into Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas, and then as they move into the Northeast, where the the um, the Corn Belt is, they're going to be reproducing in that area and moving back south in the fall. We started a um, Bring Back the Monarchs campaign with Monarch Watch, and this was initiated to educate the public about the growing need for habitat restoration on all scales, whether it be a backyard or um, a larger habitat restoration. And I'm going to outline the main milkweed uh, species of focus for this program. And you can find more information about other species on our milkweed profiles page, which is um, found very easily by clicking on the, um, the logo that you see here, the Bring Back the Monarchs logo. And you can get to the milkweed profiles from our Bring Back the Monarchs page. Um, we have distributed um, many, many milkweed plugs in flats of 32 to individuals and to larger restoration uh, it, from Monarch Watch. And we're using um, commercial growers to distribute this milkweed. So we've sold over 80,000 milkweed plugs, and we're gearing up to distribute over 100,000 plants in 2015. We do not distribute seed from Monarch Watch. It can be purchased in small amounts from our, from our website uh, for the individual gardener, but we're not using seed for restoration. We're focusing on milkweed plugs. And these plugs, as you can see here, are grown to the point where their um, roots are fairly well developed and they ship easily. The ones that you're seeing here are actually going dormant. Um, and that is seen normally uh, if you receive plants from us that don't have top growth. You can check the roots uh, of the plants by seeing that they're white and healthy. So um, a lot of the milkweed that we've been selling from Monarch Watch has been going into new and existing gardens that individual, individuals own. Some of these are registered as Monarch Way Stations, um, and that is a, a certification process that you can find on our website. Um, a lot of schools and churches and other public groups have received free milkweed from us. We have a grant from the Nat Natural Resources Defense Council to pay for that. And we're heading in the direction of larger restoration projects with our milkweed. Um, the, our goal is really to restore habitat on larger scales throughout those focus areas that I described before. So in our reg rest restoration uh, efforts, we have been talking to federal agencies, state departments of transportation, uh, and state parks. There are milkweed plugs going into all of these areas um, in the future or have, have already been going to, to those areas. Um, we're, we're starting some of the public-private pri partnerships that are coming up. Uh, in the future, we're, we're starting to have conversations with lots of different groups about that. And we're hoping that there are going to be incentive programs available to landowners so that they can um, start thinking about doing some habitat restoration on their own land. Monarch Watch uh, collects seed from individuals across the country. And we expect and hope that they will label the seed well with the seed collection information that I'll cover later. Um, and then we re redistribute those um, grown plants that we grow in the spring and the fall. 
we redistribute those uh, to ecoregions. There are other di distribution uh, methods, um, other parameters that can be used, such as radius, but this is the, the um, choice that we have made for, for redistribution. Um, you have to be careful when you're receiving seed from volunteers. A lot of times it is not well labeled, and we have uh, come across this particular season, some seed that was labeled as uh, one species, and it came up as an entirely different species. So we we um, we have to adjust our um, expectations based on that. The three species that we are focusing on at Monarch Watch um, are the ones that are most commonly encountered by monarchs as they're coming across the United States, and are um, in the most for the most part easiest to grow. Butterfly weed is not on that list of three um, because it is in high demand. We're we're asking that people donate the seed, but it also is a less important host plant for the for the monarch butterflies in most areas of the country. Um, it is a good nectar source, and um, we are having some seed source issues where uh, it is not one that is often donated to us. So green antelope horn, as you can see, is uh, one that is in the south, uh, southern part of the migration when they're coming north in the springtime. And then um, the common milkweed is one that is widely distributed across the United States in the northeast part of the butterfly's migratory range and, and reproductive areas. This is a very important species for reproduction as well as the swamp milkweed. Um, and they, the common milkweed and the swamp milkweed, as we will see, live in different ecotypes, eco ecoregions. Um, uh, they live in different habitats. And this is the distribution map for um, the Asclepius tuberosa, which is a butter butterfly weed. And many people are, are um, very familiar with this plant. So um, Asclepius viridis, which as you saw, grows in, in Texas and Oklahoma, is one that is very important in the south. Um, there's an early seed harvest for this. So if you're, if you're not paying attention, you might miss it. Um, it does require full sun. It has a, a wonderful um, flower that's got its green and purple. And again, this is the distribution, as you can see. It, it grows. Um, in most of the, the southern parts of the United States where the, the monarch migrates through. That's a repeat slide. And then the swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, is one that can tolerate um, clay soil. Most of the milkweeds cannot do that. Uh, it also has a very uh, much more of a cultivar-like behavior. The, um, the rhizomes are not ones that, um, that tend to push out into other areas as some of the, as the common milkweed does. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, it's also a very good host plant. has a lovely flower as well, and a lot of nectar is produced. This is uh, our greenhouse partner, uh, Applied Ecological Services, growing Asclepius incarnata in their greenhouse. And as you can see, there's a lot number on each tray of the, uh, you can't see it on the one, the neighbor plant, but we displayed it here, there's a lot number that demonstrates exactly where that plant comes from. So we can distribute them back to their, their origin. And this is important uh, because a lot of the plants we're seeing are not faring well in conditions, even if it's the same species um, from Minnesota versus um, the East Coast, for example. They don't, just don't fare as well, and it's important to put plants in, in areas where they came from. And again, this is the distribution map of that species. And finally, um, Asclepius syriaca is common milkweed. Uh, a lot of people do not like this plant in small gardens, but it is a great plant for restoration because it does as um, uh, a couple of other speakers were mentioning it, it does a lot of vegetation, uh, uh, vegetative reproduction by rhizomes, and it's clonal. So um, it will reproduce uh, from the roots, not so much as it does, uh, more so than it does by seed reproduction. Um, seed success is much higher in the greenhouse than it is out in the field.
it's also uh, a great nectar source for pollinators. And uh, it has hairs on the leaves, which is one of the um, uh, very tiny hairs on the leaves, which is one of the identifiers for this plant. As you can see here, there's a milkweed bug in this picture. Milkweed bug is something you're going to want to avoid if you're collecting seed. Uh, they need to be removed from all seed collection because they will actually remove the, um, the inside parts of all of the seeds. And here's a close-up of the large milkweed bug, something to look for, and the small milkweed bug. They have a proboscis that they use to pierce the seeds. And again, that distribution. And um, this is you know, the most common milkweed, which is also called common milkweed. So, And then I'm going to cover tuberosa just a little bit, even though it's, it's not favored by the monarch females when they're laying their eggs. Um, but it also, you know, we need to be able to identify it. It, um, it has pretty distinctive flowers. None of the other plants have this orange flower. And again, this is the, um, the distribution. It does prefer more sandy, much more well-drained soils, and it can, it can withstand a lot of drought conditions. And by its name, you, you know that it has a, a, a pretty tuberous root. Um, so I'm going to cover a little bit of what kinds of, um, this, this is from our website, um, and you can find this information if you click again on that logo with the Bring Back the Monarchs image. Um, collecting is, um, is going to be, the, d the different times of collection are going to be covered in just a second, but um, you want to collect milkweed species that are targeted for your area. And also, um, don't, don't collect those of rare or endangered milkweeds, of course. Ripe pods, uh, as seen in the previous slides, are um, they're going to split open easily. And the pods are going to contain seeds that are, are dark in color. So they're, they're, you don't want to collect any that are white or cream colored or pale or even green, because those will not be viable seeds if you um, collect them before they're uh, mature. And always obtain permission from landowners before collecting, even if it's on a roadside. Um, and be safe, of course. We need all milkweed to be labeled really well with the species, the name of the collectors, uh, the phone numbers so that we can get back in touch with people, um, the date of collection so we can keep track of how old the seed is, and um, any other collection information about location and comments about the habitat from which the seed came. Um, so it is really important to try to scout out milkweed sources early while the seeds are blooming, uh, while the plants are blooming, sorry. Um, and, and if needed, if the vegetation is high, mark those plants with flagging so that you can come back to them later. Um, the seed ripening does vary between species. As mentioned earlier, Asclepius viridis, the um, green antelope horn or spider milkweed, will be one of the earliest to ripen and earliest to bloom. And the pods on one plant can ripen at different times, so it might be worth it to not collect all of the pods at once and come back later. The um, Asclepius tuberosa tends to uh, bloom and go to seed before the others, but they're all, uh, they all ripen in the fall. Um, and, Asc and Asclepius incarnata, um, you're going to want to identify that before you collect the seed so that you can make sure that you're not mislabeling it as Asclepius syriaca. Once the seeds start to mature, sometimes the leaves also fall off. And Asclepius syriaca um, is disperse, disperses its seeds over a longer period of time, so it's often available for a longer period of time, and it's, it's easier to get more seed from, from that um, particular plant because you're more likely to come across seed that's mature. And I would like to thank um, the director of Monarch Watch, Chip Taylor, and Elliot Dumler for some of the photos of the greenhouse uh, production at Applied Ecological Services. And we're going on to Wendy Caldwell. Well, thank you, everybody, all of our presenters, for, for 
sharing your expertise with us today. Um, for those of you that have to jump off the call, feel free to get off at any time, but we're going to stick around and facilitate a question answer period and try to circle back to some of the things that, that were brought up during in the chat box during the presenting. Um, so thank you all for participating in this collaborative webinar of the Monarch Joint Venture and the Fish and Wildlife Services National Conservation Training Center. We are grateful for the expertise of NCTC in, in providing this technology for us. Um, thank you to all of my presenters and partners for bringing the information together. Your time and expertise is very valued. Um, so I hope that you all learned some really valuable things today. and, and We'll learn some more in this question and answer period. So if you missed any part of the webinar or would like to refresh on any of the topics, the webinar will be archived and we'll email you a link afterwards um, when, once it goes live. And as Kareen mentioned, that'll be within a week of today. So we'll do our best to follow up with any of the questions that we did not, we don't cover in this question and answer period. But make sure that you visit the Monarch Joint Venture website and all of the partners that you heard from today, visit their websites to, to learn more about the resources that they presented on. And um, make sure to follow up with any feedback that you have with the survey that comes out by email. So with that, um, thank you for everyone that has to leave us now. But I'm going to jump into some questions for our presenters if they're all ready. And I'm going to start with. Um, a question for Greg, I'm going to direct this at you, but anyone feel free to jump in. Some of our participants wanted to know a little bit more about mowing and how, how to use mowing effectively in managing these landscapes for higher diversity um, and timing of mowing for native pollinators and monarchs specifically. Um, so if anybody wants to jump in and just talk a little bit more about mowing. Yeah, this is Greg. Laura, um, so you, you've done some research on that topic. You might have a little more uh, actual experience with that. Sure. Um, yeah, I can talk about that a little bit. I think it's a distinct topic from mowing for of established stands that already have, you know, habitat in them. That's that's more of a on a yearly basis doing that or 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 using fire for brush control. But for establishment of forbs into uh, a, a species poor stand, I really loved your slides, Greg, that showed just the, what the, what the uh, dilemma is for a tiny seed in those great big grasses. You know, they're just going to kill them. So we used, um, ours was an experimental system. It wasn't meant to be a practical application. But we mowed weekly. Uh, and. Uh, we kept raising the cutter bar gradually over the season. The grasses, as they were clipped back every week, didn't leave enough thatch to smother anything. And the new establishing seedlings were still shorter than that cutter bar. And that allowed them to get plenty of light. And, um, and, and also at the same time, the grasses around them were being repeatedly stressed and weakened by that mowing regime. Now, you wouldn't have to, to do that extreme of a treatment. Um, we tried it again uh, 10 years later in the same area, and we only mowed every two or three weeks. Um, and that was sufficient to keep the thatch from being too, um, too thick when it, when it did get mowed off. But that was, a, that was an effective treatment for an area where you can get a, a mower onto the site, and you can afford to to mow it often enough and pay attention so that it doesn't get ahead of you. If, if you forget or somebody takes your mower and you can't get in in time, you'll have tall, tall grasses and seedlings that are, that are dying in there. And uh, once it gets very shady, the seedlings get long and tall and etiolated. And then when you do find the time to mow, you chop their heads off. So it's important to stay with it and to have somebody there who's committed to paying attention to that stand and mowing frequently that first year. Uh, but after that, you've got new species of forbs in with the grasses. And the grasses come back. They don't die, at least in our experience. And, and now, you have a, uh, now you have something that has um, valuable uh, butterfly habitat. 
And I'll add that in regard to monarchs, um, it's, it's important to time mowing around times that the monarchs might not be in peak reproduction. So um, you can follow some citizen science programs like Journey North or the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project just to see what monarch activity is happening in your site that particular week or month. And, and just try to avoid those peak monarch times because you don't want to be mowing the whole field of milkweed that might be, or the whole prairie field that might be full of monarch caterpillars and then the mower would in turn destroy the insects along with the plants. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about mowing a site. And, and, and also, maybe not in the first few years of establishing a prairie, but as you're doing, if you're using mowing as a long-term management strategy, um, it's important to maybe leave parts of the habitat intact as refuge for wildlife and pollinators and, and really anything that's out there, um, just to make sure that you're not disturbing the entire habitat all at one time. Um, the next question I'm going to pose to the group is, if you could all talk a little bit more about where, where people might go for um, help in their region. So are there particular groups or agencies that, that have resources available, um, person resources, staff resources available, that if they have questions for their particular ecotype, their particular region of the country, um, are there people that they might look to for help in management? I could take that real quick. This is Mary Byrne from the Pollinator Partnership. Um, we have people spread out all across the country in Canada now. So um, contact either Vicki or myself if you need additional support or resources. This is Laura. Um, just to add to that, the, uh, in some states there are county conservation organizations. That's this, um, they have nature centers. They have uh, parks and acquisitions where they're, they're planting prairie. And so there is often good expertise there. In our state, in addition to that, there's roadside managers that might be able to help. There are prairie cl uh, groups and clubs like Iowa Prairie Network that have people in them that are very experienced with, with planting habitat. Um, and uh, then there are also people that are in business to do just that. We have a, a web so website called plantiowanative.com, and in that we have a list of, uh, provi of service providers who, who would uh, consult with you and, um, and, and do that for, that's what they do for a living. So there's a variety of different uh, resources depending on where you are, but at the county level, at the state DNR level, that are pe there are people, Department of Natural Resources, there are people that have those skills, and then uh, down to the uh, the, the citizen, volunteer, homeowner kind of person who's just happened to acquire those skills. Thanks. Um, the next question should be easy. Maybe Angie or Laura, I think you both would be well equipped to answer this question. I know it's going to be different for each species, but um, in general, how long do milkweed seeds stay viable once collected? Well, they should be properly stored. That, that's the main thing. They should, when they're collected, they should be dried immediately or they will mold. And um, then uh, we dry them in, in bags uh, with a, a fan. <laughs> and then um, once they're dried, they can be put in, we put them into a climate controlled conditions. And um, our seeds can last for 10 years in those climate controlled conditions, but that's not ideal. Uh, if, it's, if it's not under climate control, then a good uh, one humid hot summer can kill most of them. I would like to second the um, making sure that your, your seeds are dry. We, uh, we often um, will receive seeds that have been packed up in uh, Ziploc bags or something with a li even a little bit of moisture. And, and uh, we sometimes are just, just really frustrated by, by that because we, you know, someone has taken a lot of time to collect those seeds. And um, 
unfortunately they may not be viable anymore. One way to check the viability of seeds is if you, um, if you break a seed in half by pressing it, uh, your fingernail against it. Uh, if, generally speaking, if the seed is uh, white on the inside and not dark brown or black on the inside, that's a good chance that that seed is viable. Of course, um, it's not 100% uh, reliable, but that, that's a good test to just initial, an initial test to see if it's viable seed. Thanks. Uh, Mary and Vicki, a question for you. Someone has utility lines on private property. How do they start the process of getting permission from utility companies to develop pollinator habitat? Um, I guess my advice would be, and I think somebody said this on the chat, simply call the number either you know, on the poll there um, or call the, the local office that's responsible for it. It's um, sometimes as easy as just starting that initial conversation. Sometimes it takes a little more um, effort. Um, working with a group of neighbors or other stakeholders is also helpful if you don't get um, an immediate response. Yeah, and I would just follow up on um, saying something really similar. You know, you, you're actually more than welcome to call utility companies and inquire about what their management regimes and programs are because they all have something in place. And that would be a, a really good approach to see if they do have a vegetation management plan that considers wildlife and pollinators or not and a great opportunity to start the conversation. And I guess I would just add, you know, just remember when you initially approach the utility company, their number one priority is to develop safe and efficient electrical service. Um, you know, they're not legally mandated to develop monarch habitat. Sometimes they, you know, will simply say we don't have this in our budget. Um, so just be sensitive that initially they may not see the benefit and, you know, at the end of the day it's not their number one res responsibility. But working with them over time, you could, um, you know, see how, uh, you know, pointing a few things out, they may become um, more inclined to do um, monarch habitat. Great. Um, to respect everyone's time, I'm going to ask one more question, and then I think we'll wrap it up for the day. Um, Laura, Christine, this is a question for you. Um, there was kind of, there's quite a few questions about the Iowa IRVM program and how this might be applicable in other states. Do you have advice moving forward for other states to try to implement something similar? Um, because you have legislation and you have some additional resources, how might, you know, what's your advice for other states? And there was one other question about, is yellow tag certification local to Iowa or is it used everywhere? Well, thanks for the question. I would say certainly contact one of the IRVM coordinators in the states that do have IRVM programs, that could be me, or I know Minnesota has a program, and just figure out how have these states gotten their programs started? Because I think the resources or the obstacles and challenges are going to vary a little bit from state to state. I know in Iowa there's just a lot of support from it in the late 80s because of the concern about water quality. That was the cultural shift that got this legislation in place. Now, I guess now there might be other incentives depending on the state you're in, but certainly you can look at our website about information about starting an IRVM program or just contact me directly if you want to learn more and I'd be certainly happy to talk to you about it. Great. Well, I'm going to end it with that and thank you everybody that stuck around to answer questions. We're, we're grateful for your time and I hope you learned a lot. <laughs>